Okay, so um, the, title, the official title for this, as this is too loud, that's the question. I've been asked to use the mic, so let's make sure it's not too loud. Um, the official title for this is something boring because Carl Berry asked me to change it so that you can find more easily on the internet. Um, but the original title, which I'm going to stick to here, is Joseph Adventures in Unicode Land, because I thought that was more fun. Um, so I shouldn't really need to introduce Unicode Land, I think, to most of the audience, but uh, just as a brief reminder, it's the idea that we can move from various input encodings and different ways of storing data into a place where um, all of our input has a defined um, home, as it were. Each character has one uh, universally agreed uh, position and our com uh, computational systems can therefore pick it up. The problem is Unicode land is still being developed, it's still being explored, it's not all mapped. And for tech, that particularly means we have three engines of which one PDF tech is an 8 engine, which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, but two, ZTech and LuaTech, in common use, I realise the Japanese market has other uh, techs and there are some sort of specialists which one could think about. But uh, ZTech and LuaTech are both Unicode engines, but we need to make them work properly. We need to guide them through Unicode land. I thought, though, I'd start off with a, 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 a quote I stumbled across on the Unicode website. It's one of these little tickers that comes down, but they had one concluded, so I thought we should have that. And it's very interesting, um, he of course goes for the hard copy version of the Unicode standard, so he'll be stuck at Unicode 5, I think it is, which is the last one that was available in print. Um, I think uh, I do like this, it's the most use, it's the best tool uh, for helping to bring understanding between different people and different cultures. So I thought we should uh, bear that in mind. If we're going to map out Unicode land, we're going to need, well, we're going to need some maps to help us to navigate Unicode land. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these maps to do two separate tasks. Um, so I'm going to use different maps. So the first one is Unicode standard. We have already heard how exciting standards are uh, this morning. Uh, luckily, the Unicode standard is freely available, and you can get it off their website and read the exciting implementer's guide, which I've been reading various bits of. Um, but they provide us with a series of human and machine-readable files, which we'll have a look at some of those in a minute, um, starting off with this file, Unicode data. Um, which is a master list of all the defined code points, that's the defined effectively letters in Unicode. Um, that file, for various reasons, is, doesn't have any version data in it, which I might mention toward the end as being a bit of a pain. Uh, the other files sensibly do tell you when they were released. Um, and they define different aspects, so these are like different paths, if you like, to our, this world of Unicode land. Um, so we can see we've got East Asian width and line break, which are going to be important for the first part of my talk, and then special casing and case folding, which are going to be important for the second part. Um, so my talk's really going to be divided into two, two different uh, little mini-adventures in Unicode land. And the first one is about how we set up characters. And um, quite sensibly, <coughs> neither these are called Luatec hard code in. Uh, bits of Unicode, it's an evolving standard and we need to have flexibility. <laughs> what they do is they have to provide us with the uh, mechanism to deal with Unicode characters. So in order to set up uh, a tech or a LaTeX run, um, unsurprisingly I'm going to be focused on LaTeX, but um, some of this will be relevant to other formats, uh, we need to define things like, you know, with a, with a classical 8-bit setup, we can define by hand what's a letter, what's what should be the lowercase mapping of that letter, etc. Um, we don't really want to do that for the whole of the Unicode uh, character range. Not only would it be incredibly, incredibly labour-intensive, but it would also be uh, error-prone, and it would make it very difficult to keep up with changes in the standard. Uh, so we want to automatically define those things. We also want, so if we're talking about the Unicode engines, they, they provide us with these various primitives to do with Unicode math type setting, which is an area that Will is going to talk a, a little bit more about, uh, but for, from my point of view, we just have to set the right codes uh, in some way. Um, we came into this because this has obviously been true since ZTech was first developed. We had Unicode engines, but we've ended up with two engines, and up to last year, if you took the Tech Live or MicTech formats that were being built, they were built by adding various things onto the standard later format, and Frank will talk about that, I'm sure. 
um, about what we've been doing about that. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to bring that data back in house, as it were, but also have them in sync. So if you look at if you look at Tech Live 2014, you'll find that the, the two engines read different versions of the standard, um, and that's fine for the bits which have been agreed for years. So if you're Western European, you won't notice any difference because that part hasn't changed. But if you're looking at some other parts of the standard, it, it does vary. So we wanted to keep those, we want to keep those in sync. But at the same time, uh, we do have to recognise that ZTEC has uh, this idea of uh, inter-character classes, which LuaTeX doesn't have. Now, I, you can do that differently in LuaTeX, but it's built in as a primitive into ZTEC, so we wanted to, to, to handle that, but in a way which doesn't end up with two separate files, which is the way it's been handled to date. We also wanted to have a very clear relationship between UCD, that's the Unicode character database, that's, the, that's our maps of Unicode land, and what setup you get out. So that means you're going to do this, trans we need to set up a mechanical <coughs> translation of the data that goes in to uh, what comes out. So I'm going to switch now to the live demo. This is where everything of course will go wrong, as we've already seen. Live demos are brilliant. So what we need to do, I've got these files here. I've, grabbed, I've downloaded, this is, I've got the Unicode 8 files. That's the latest release, released um, last month, earlier this month, maybe? Very, very recently. Um, and still not, the, the, the standard hasn't actually been released yet, but the data files have. Um, and what we need to do is we want to take those. So this is the master file Unicode data. And you'll see that, let's see, can we make that a bit bigger? No, I can't. No, can't make it bigger. <laughs> oh, well. Um, hopefully you can see that. It's, um, well, it's, it's machine readable, but we don't really want to be reading through all of that every time we, we set up a tech run. You'll see this, a lot of this is completely irrelevant to us. The fact that, so, um, you've got over here, this is the code point, the character. There's a human readable description. This I'm going to want for case changing in a bit. That tells me what kind of character it is. Um, I'm going to want this stuff at the end. That's a case mapping. But there's all sorts of other stuff in there, and it doesn't look that friendly to read. And not all of these are things we need to worry about. So, you know, the first one here, 0000, zero, zero, zero no. Well, yeah, that will be, we can just leave that alone. Um, there's also in here, it's not obvious, but there's some bits that are done as ranges, and they're a bit tricky um, to handle. So we've got things like that. We want to pass that in in some way. Uh, but we can't only pass that file because there's this file here, East Asian width, and it defines the, some additional behaviours of East Asian characters, which you need to read as well as the Unicode's main file to set things up. Uh, we also need to read line break, uh, which is another one of these files. They're all quite, they're all designed to be machine readable. What they're not designed to do, of course, is support tech. They're designed to support the whole world, everything. And so they don't describe things like the category code and the UC code and map code. So we have to make some decisions about how we're going to do that mapping. Um, and what we've done there is we've essentially followed... So when ZTEC was being developed, first being developed, Jonathan Q had to tackle the same problem. And he made some decisions about how he was going to, to do those mappings. So you say, well, if it's, got, if it's described by Unicode as a letter, then presumably it should be cat code 11. You should be able to use it in control sequences. He also decided there are some things that are described by them as combining marks, uh, which can appear inside words, but which aren't formally letters. He decided that they also need to be cat code 11 because if you're writing a word in a language where you use one of those, it would be a natural character to potentially have in a word. So they're cat code 11 as well. You need to set up the math code. You need to set, we've got the case mappings. We've just seen that for LC code, particularly obviously important for doing hyphenation. And so, so Jonathan Q had written a Perl script to do that, and um, we wanted to have something uh, similar. So it basically follows the same rules as he did, but we've read it in using, in our case, I think it's, uh, I'm using PDF tech to actually do the parsing. They're relatively, it's uh, more of a mechanical job than anything. You have to worry about a few things. You've got more than nine different fields in the Unicode database, so you can't just read it with one tech macro, but you can read it with two. Sort of boring stuff like that. But what we can end up doing is we can take those data files and we can read them in and we can make a, a, a definition file. Let's see. Is this going to work? So, and we end up with a file that looks like this. Most of it, that's a bit set up, but most of it is quite boring. It reads very quickly. You won't even notice 
um, on a modern system, you won't actually notice reading that. It's been doing some experiments for other things, again, which Frank will talk about. Uh, the one thing I'll point out, that uh, we've heard about MD5 systems and how useful they are. Um, as I said, Unicode don't provide, um, don't tell us what uh, version Unicode data.txt is. So again, Carl Berry was very keen that we had some traceable information about that. So if you look in our data file, it's got the MD5 sums for the data files, which whoever creates this file, me in other words, has, has used. And that's why I'm using PDF tech, because it's got a built-in primitive uh, for that. Um, you can, as we've heard, do it in Lua tech, and soon we've got to do it in Z6 as well. But it will work, you look, because all the, all the database files are actually in uh, seven, uh, ASCII encoded, so we don't have to worry about using a, a Unicode engine to actually read that data. So that's all very clever, uh, all very mechanical, but it reads all of that data into, into those engines, and it does all of those things. So we've got a conditional in there that check, picks up if you're using ZTEC or LuaTeX, and if you're using LuaTeX, it doesn't try to set the integer char class, unsurprisingly, but it does all the other things that happen. So if you look at the old file, the, the difference was, one of the differences was that things which have an integer char class need to have particular um, cat codes, but they were sticked entirely by the LuaTeX file, so that you ended up, David discovered for us very nicely, that you've got different cat codes depending on ZTEC and LuaTeX in some places, and it wasn't obvious, so we track that down. There's a clear relationship. It's all mechanical. We don't um, make any decisions about there are certain things. Again, Will might mention that. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not. There's, there's certain things that, that you might want to worry about doing differently, but we think at the format level we should be just reading that in mechanically. We also, I didn't put it on there, but we wanted the file readable by plain tech as well as LaTeX because we think that probably Having one file which defines these codes would be useful uh, across the board. And I think <coughs> Carl is therefore going to be setting up uh, TechLive to read our files with plain as well. So that's setting things up, and that applies to LaTeX 2E. And that's uh, sort of picking up on something that's already been done, but trying to, to get it a bit tidier. Uh, the second part of what I want to do is talk about case changing in a bit more complicated way. And the reason is, we've already seen it in a way. Unicode and tech, you know, Unicode defines things generally, tech community defines things in its own way. Um, traditionally, we've got case changing in tech based on the idea, based on ideas that work very well in English. Basically, you have lowercase letters and you have other lowercase letters, and you can go from one to the other, and that's it. It's nice and simple. English is very, very simple, so um, very easy to implement. Unfortunately, it turns out it's all a bit more complicated than that. So, if, you, if you're bored and you want to have a, have a nice nap, you can read the Unicode standard, and it will tell you all about case cha changing. And Unicode define, well, three case changing things, and one thing which is very similar to case changing, so I'll put on the same slide. So, they define, so you can have lower casing and upper casing, which broadly follow exactly what we might expect. Uh, so, you map them to their lower case or upper case code points, but as I said, um, apply context and language rules, and that's going to be important. Uh, we've then got title casing. Now, I think they've picked the wrong term here, because certainly in English, title casing normally implies something about <coughs> sentences. What they mean by title casing is that in some case, in some particular circumstances, there are letters where, to make a word title case, you don't make the first letter uppercase and the rest lowercase. You make the first letter sort of uppercase, not quite. And there's a few, I will have a demonstration to show this because I think it, it is best explained by seeing what it means. But the point is that only applies to the first letter, well they actually say letter, and then they don't, I'm not sure they define letters in the, um, in the, in the Unicode uh, standard, but I, I'm not gonna, I haven't pursued that. They do say letter. They also define case folding. Now case folding is a programmer's thing. And what it is, is it's removing the case information from from information for machine-based comparisons. Now, most people do this by simply lowercasing everything, and case folding looks almost exactly like lowercasing. So again, for English, it is lowercasing. But it's not the same, and one of the things that's not the same is case <coughs> folding is, does follow that idea of it's a one-to-one -one mapping. You, um, it's one-to-one -one mapping in one direction. So you go from one position to another position. There's no context dependence, and it's a fixed mapping. There's no language dependence or anything. Lower casing isn't the same. 
Lower casing should have language dependence and it should have context dependence. And we're going to see examples of both of those. <coughs> so I was thinking about case folding and I decided what I wanted to do was implement all of this for ZTech and LuaTech. And what I wanted to do is implement those context and language um, dependent mappings for LaTeX 3, Xball 3 programming. What I also wanted to do is I didn't want to use LC code and UC code. And the reason is not only because they're tied to one-to-one -one mapping, but because particularly LC code is used for something else. They're used for different things. LC code of characters is used by text hyphenation. And that's, you can't avoid that, but you can avoid using it for case changing if you store the case changing data somewhere else. We wanted, we thought we could do this expandably. Um, it's quite difficult to explain. Most programming languages will let you store the lower or uppercase representation thing by saying, make it lowercase. In tech, you can't, you can only do that a certain way. It's not easy with lower, the, the lowercase and uppercase primitives. I also wanted to take some, steal some ideas from, from David Carlyle and handle math mode um, as he does in his text case uh, package. So you could have some math mode and skip it. I also wanted an escape mechanism. Um, and I thought, um, we thought, we can do this. This is, this is, this is going to be easy. <laughs> um, so not all my ideas, sort of this, the, the basic stuff comes from Bruno. So this is going to be a live demo because I think this works better. Let's see, I'll zoom that up a bit because you can't probably see that. Oh, uh, where are we? Uh, what do I want? I've got the font, don't I? Probably better, yeah. So it's not really type set output here, it's just going to be down the bottom there. So, what I've got at the top is, I'm not the, the, the names we've adopted for this for x 3 aren't particularly interesting, so I've just defined them so I can hide all that away and we can have our demo down here. So the first thing we start off with, so the first thing to point out for you know, our tech phone is I'm using, I'm, I'm doing all this inside an EDEF, everything's being expanded, and I'm just showing you what the result is. So we're storing it in a macro. So the first example is a simple one. So I'm going to take some English text here and say make it up a case. And it's made the text part of a case, and it's picked up the fact we've got a math mode escape character here and it skips that part. Um, so there's a list, there's a, it's not hard coded, but there's a list of, of identifiers to look for, which I've set up, oddly enough, with a uh, uh, dollar sign and with um, LaTeX uh, math mode. So backslash um, open bracket and backslash um, open parenthesis. And it's done that. So that's not particularly impressive. You could do that lots of other ways. Um, I've added on the idea of having some way of escaping the, the check case changing, and I've stolen there David's name from, from text case. That's not hard coded in. I've actually had to set that up at the beginning because this is stuff where I put it somewhere at the top there. What? It is hard coded. Is it? <laughs> I can't remember. Maybe that one is hard coded. I can't remember. Uh, so the idea is that this is oh uh, that that's gone wrong. Oh dear. That's because I haven't added, that's because it isn't hard coded and I haven't put it onto the list. Bear with me a second, this is the danger of doing de live demos. I have to what the thing's called. I remember I've edited this and I've forgotten to redo that. So, ah oh dear. And I now can't remember what the list is called that it's actually on either. So I have to look it up. This is the danger of that. The one, that's the one, exclude. So we'll try that again. There we are. So this is an example from my day job. So I'm a chemist by actual profession. So this here relates to something I do at work. And chemical um, elements should never be case changed uh, because it changes what the element is. So, um, so there we are. So that works and it, it's skipped over. So we're going to see this example a few times. Um, so this is the example where we haven't got a one-to-one -one mapping. So. If you follow the Unicode standard, and we'll come on to the 
course, it's S set in a bit. Um, lowercase s set maps to an uppercase uh, just two s's. Now, you can't do that with the tet uppercase primitive because it doesn't understand the idea that it might not be a one-to-one -one mapping. But here we've got that built in, so the s set has turned into just two capital S's. And that, of course, emphasizes why uh, case changing um, is not a round trip operation either, because I read lowercase that, that's just two s's at this stage, and the computer can't know that it came from a, an s set. So uh, it's one of the things that Unicode uh, likes to emphasize. The next demo will have some Greek. Now, Greek is the most difficult language in the world for case changing. And it's not all implemented yet because I haven't got round to trying to tackle the problems. But this bit is implemented. So here we've got Odysseus, um, which has got two different kinds of sigma in it. And, OK, I've ignored the, the capital letter at the beginning for the, beginning, for the moment. Uh, but you can see down here, we end up with two different kinds of sigma. Uh, we end up with the, the terminal sigma for the where we've gone from the end, but inside we end up with these um, internal signals. So that's done. Um, you have to look ahead. You need to be context dependent, and you therefore can't do that just again by having a, a simple mapping, even if you tackle the problem of, um, of the non-one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, the next one's a, a nice demo from Turkish. So first of all, if I just do the case changing in without telling you this is Turkish, uh, this is a name, it's got two different kinds of I in it, and I'm sure many people know in Turkish, an uppercase I with a dot and an uppercase I without a dot are different letters, and they map, they should map to a lowercase I with and without a dot. Um, which is confusing as, 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 as heck, but there we are, that's how, that's, that's how Turkish works. So if we don't know that, and we just do standard case changing, we end up with the wrong result, because that uppercase I here, in English or German or any other language, is mapping to a lowercase i with a dot. So that's wrong. So we tell the system, so here I've set this one up, I've just given it a star, and I've told it we're looking at Turkish, and now it knows that Turkish has a lowercase i without a dot, and we get the right output. So. Did it actually put two dots on the second i when it didn't know it was Turkish? It may well have done, because that's probably typed in, because you've got the i. If you, the official position with the mapping, if it's, if it's a dot, it's a separate character, it's dot above. And so the, the UCD, if you just follow it without any language dependence, says the dot above stays there, which is, that's what the rules say. Um, so you keep it. And then, yes, when you, um, it's only with the language dependence that that gets mapped. So yeah, you, you know, as I said, a bit like I was saying about the uh, other part of my talk, you just, the basics are you try and follow the standards. It doesn't always necessarily make 100% sense. But that's what you do. Um, well, because otherwise, otherwise you get into Unicode have done certain maps. They've done a lot of work. The standard is huge. Um, I don't want to redo that. Okay, so here we are. So this is one about title casing. I'm trying to show what it actually means. So here I've got this is a single single code point. It's a DZ character. I'm not sure I've put it in the font I'm using, but it's a single code point. So if I uppercase it, it turns into a single code point DZ. <laughs> But if it's at the start of a word, that would be wrong. It should turn into a character which has a, looks like a capital letter D followed by a lowercase z. And that's the title case thing that Unicode talk about. And so that's what we get if we tell it. The best name I could come up with this, for this was mixed case, because it's not really title case, certainly not the way it's usually described in English. So we, I've called it mixed case. Better names are very welcome. I, I don't have one. Um, so there's only a few characters, there's about 20 or 30 characters in the whole Unicode database where that applies to, but you have to implement it. So the next one's a Dutch example. So if English people were to take this, this word here, Isomir, and capitalise it, we'd capitalise it like that. Capital I and a lowercase j. That's wrong. <laughs> um, certainly for Dutch, it should do like that. So again, we've got a language dependent. Um, IJ at the start of word in Dutch, if you're making it into title case, that's mixed case as I've called it, should be capitalised as though it's one letter, although it's input as two separate normal letters. It's just written with I and a J. I was asked to make sure this point as well. There is some code in here that picks up the first, tries to find the first letter of a, of a word rather than the first character. So um, 
Here I've put some quote marks around something and uh, quote mark is one of the ones that the code knows is not a letter and therefore it doesn't capitalise it, it picks up where the letter, the first letter is. So back to our case folding. So if I case fold, so back with Fussbau, um, if I case fold Fussbau, it should turn in, that S step should turn into two S's, lowercase S's, because for comparison value purposes, it should be the, treated in the same way. And the same, exactly the same idea, if I take my Odysseus example again, and I <laughs> case fold that, there's no context dependence, there's only one kind of sigma, and so in this case, I don't get that lowercase sigma, so it's not the same as case as lower casing. Um, so just to show you what happens if you round trip something, it does round trip. So this is all um, done. In a, I've, this is all set up so it's functional. It's a function-like expansion, so it, it expands the inner part before it expands the outer part. And to show that, here we've got I've saved well, foo in a macro, and it's doing that by expanding it. Currently, it doesn't pick up LaTeX 2E robust commands. Doable, but it's very, very painful, and I don't really want to do that. So my recommendation is to simply use um, to, to use the fact that with using ZTech and LaTeX, this is you've got to have ETech available. Make the commands of engine robust, and they're skipped. Uh, so here, if I make this, if I make TextVF en engine robust using the robustify um, command from eToolbox, then it just gets skipped over. Um, I have added on um, picking up a LaTeX 2E's LICR, so it knows about uh, an awful lot. That's painful as well, but that seems necessary, so I did it. Um, to pick up all of those and to, to case change those properly. And one that got added this morning, I was being asked about, I was being asked repeatedly about the Glossus S set. So as of this morning, I've added on a, I, again, good names would be useful. I don't know what to call this. I've called it DE Alt for the moment. Um, and this will then give you the Corsus S set when you capitalise rather than turning it into two capital S's. So the point be, the wider point being that we can add on customised uh, locales for special effects. They're a bit tricky to write, but there's probably not going to be that many of them, so I think I can cope with doing that. I'll be careful in Switzerland, there are two S's. <laughs> yes, well, I, but, that, but, that, but that's, that's, so what I should say is there's no attempt at all to, to deal with anything to do with the, I just take the, so some of the code points are deprecated by Unicode, but there's no attempt to turn those into the officially, um, the, the, there's no, I just, the code currently just case changes them as is, so if someone's decided to put in a deprecated code point, it stays that way, that's, that's their business, that, so, if they decide to spell it in Swiss, if they don't use it, then they, you know, that's their business again. Um, so, to finish off, we we'll just put that back on full screen, I think. So, if you want to talk about it, we've got lots of ways, to get, again, we, we, we could chat about that. So, this, so, that second part of the code is in the export. Um, you can get hold of me lots of ways, should you wish to. Uh, people choose all kinds of different ways of getting hold of me. Right, they've been my recent adventures in Unicode land. I guess the next one is trying to do sorting or something, but um, that one looks like um, an even bigger challenge, and uh, probably won't Bruno into that, because he's his, his area of expertise. Uh, so, that's, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, in some styles of writing, the, the capital S set is also an S to Z. Yes. Could that be implemented, or is that something that you could do it? It's, you could, it's, 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 so the way that all that works is if you've got, you just have to define the appropriate macros hidden away that have that the right in the right namespace and have that some naming. So you, provided you can pick, think of a naming. A unique naming scheme. That's that's the problem. So all the other ones were done some time ago because, like Dutch, it's easy. It's NL um, or Turkish. But this, I know, it could end up with a very long name. 
but I don't have a better name, so that's why at present I've just added it as alt. Better names required. So you mentioned uh, the East Asian width uh, yeah. and line break yeah. uh, files. Where are they used? Okay, okay, I didn't explain. So what happens is, if you look at Jonathan Hughes Perl script that I've picked up on, or if you look at our conversion script for making the uh, case changing data, there are various properties described in those files which impact on what should be treated as letters and what should be what, um, and for the uh, for ZTEC for the inter character classes. So to know what inter character classes you need to read those. It's not in the Unicode data file, it's in those other files. So you need to read all of those in order to get all of them. In fact, there's a change I would probably make because looking through some comments on the Perl script, part of the cat code stuff probably can be dropped with some other changes, which I will likely do when I update that data from Unicode 7 to Unicode 8 for, for later. But I haven't, I'm, that's, I need to check that that works. I haven't checked it through yet. But yeah, you need it for, you need it for the inter-character classes. 